On all critical counts, Mercedes has scored with its sensational and wonderfully advanced 300 SL sports car. So you can't climb Everest, you can't have Monroe, and you're not likely ever to ride a rocket to the moon. But you can, if you're properly healed, achieve an experience that's in the same ultimate class, you can get yourself a Mercedes-Benz 300 SL. And if you really respond to machinery, the effect is the same. After exhaustive road testing of a standard 300 SL, after driving impressions in a race-tuned version and interviews with several owners and specialist technicians, I'm ready to haul off and make a flat, unequivocal statement. This is the finest production sports car in the world. No exceptions, no qualifications. On all critical counts, it scores. As a piece of automotive sculpture, the 300 SL is a masterpiece. With its gold wing doors and its own Teutonic treatment of hippie, organic contours, it stands splendidly apart from all the cliches of post-war styling, including the much plagiarized Italian school. The 300 SL is a car that can take first place in a concours d'elegance, then clobber all comers in a tough race. Manifestations of its might are victories won all over Europe and the United States from the world's best all-out competition sports cars. At the same time, it's a luxury carriage. Sports cars, as a rule, offer little in the way of comforts and nice refinements. In fact, starkness is part of the stock and trade of most sports car builders. But the 300 SL achieves the all-weather comfort and the rich finish of fine luxury cars without engineering compromise that rarely challenged excuse for typical sports car asceticism. Beyond this, the 300 SL is prophecy incarnate. It's a pace setter, a style setter, a design conception that is bound to influence the world's automotive industry for many years to come. For example, a top Detroit stylist tells me that the 300 SL's roof doors are sure to be copied in the coming U.S. cars because they are the only means of getting in and out of the kind of ultra-low vehicles that the buying public craves. Several Detroit Idea cars already have imitated this feature. And styling is the least of the 300 SL's shock treatments to the industry. Gasoline fuel injection, FI, first pioneered on the 300 SL, will give the internal combustion engine a new lease on life and probably delay the advent of gas turbines for years. Detroit, aware that FI means instantaneous throttle response, more horsepower, and lower body lines, is already working all out on injection. At the last count, there were 18 300 SLs in the possession of Detroit manufacturers who are boning up on FI secrets. Another feature that's bound to be copied is the position of the 300 SL's engine, mounted on its side to lower body lines and the center of gravity. The brakes are novel. While brake diameters in all cars have shrunk to conform to shrinking tire sizes, it took the designers of the 300 SL to think of widening the brakes to compensate for the lost friction area. The 300 SL has four-wheel independent suspension, a feature of Mercedes-Benz cars since the early 30s. This, too, is being readied on Detroit drawing boards. Even the intricate and expensive trapezoidal frame may be adapted to automation's techniques. Literally, the 300 SL is a car of the future that can be possessed today. All 300 SLs are not necessarily alike. The standard package that you buy across the counter costs $7,463 at U.S. Port of Entry. It's a magnificent performer, with dazzling acceleration and a top speed of nearly 140 miles per hour. But there are many performance options. It's beautifully, finely finished, but there are many finish options. The result is that although you can get a 300 SL for under $7,500, few are sold for less than $8,000 after license, sick, fees, taxes, and options have been added. And if you want a 160 miles per hour, all-out competition 300 SL, you can invest $10,000 or $11,000 with no difficulty. But don't get the idea that the Pin Money 300 SL is anything less than a going bomb. The Fire Engine Red, strictly standard model that I first drove came to my door equipped with Meister Mechaniker Robert Ludge, an expert technician sent to the U.S. by the Mercedes factory to train agency mechanics. He tossed the door up, slid over to the passenger's side, and I entered. With the 300 SL, this is something of an art and it varies according to build, sex, and dress. 
For the first or fiftieth time, it's a thrill. Actually, the car is not a handy package to climb in and out of, but the mild gymnastics involved are a small price to pay for what you get. The somewhat limited entry area provided by the roof doors is dictated not by the car's lowness alone, but also by the extreme depth of the light, rigid, three-dimensional tubular frame. When you sit in the car, your elbow rests on the door sill, which is wrapped over the top frame members. To simplify entry and exit for the driver, all 300 SLs are equipped with a steering wheel that can be folded under the steering column. Also, although the steering column is not adjustable, you can have your choice of two different column lengths. The doors can be locked from the outside by the conventional method. To open them, you press a slightly protruding cam which exposes the door handle. Give this an easy outward and upward tug and the door floats up to its full open position, aided by springs that give just the correct amount of counterbalance. The door must be slammed hard to be closed and this produces a loud, jarring thud. On the inside door handle of every new 300 SL is a somewhat disquieting notice urging that doors be locked from the inside to guard against their opening spontaneously at high speed. When you're seated in a 300 SL you know you're in. You are practically encapsulated. You feel very much a part of the car, as you should be. Visibility is good. Straight ahead and just below eye level are a big tach and a big speedometer. There are plenty of other instruments and controls, and they take some time to learn. The first thing I noticed was the low mileage registered on the odometer, significantly below the 1,000 mile break-in period recommended by the factory. But Lutz put me at ease. You don't have to worry about winding up these engines, he said. Before they're even dropped into a car, they run for 24 hours on a dynamometer, including 6 hours at peak output. Then they're torn down, checked, reassembled, and given another 8 hours of running in. Our times may be a shade slow, but don't be afraid to peak it in the gears. The tricks of firing up a fuel injection car are few and simple. For cold starts you pull out what corresponds to a choke and for hot starts you pull out a different button that causes a whining, high-speed pump to go to work in the fuel tank. It not only purges vapor pockets from the fuel system when hot, but also makes available a 2-gallon reserve fuel supply. The factory recommends that the extra pump be used continuously during high-speed operation. This is not one of those engines the existence of which its makers have spent millions to hide. It explodes into urgent, buzzing life, idling at a busy but smooth 750 RPM and every fiber of the beast is ready to charge. The 300 SL has positive synchromesh on all four of its forward speeds. You thrust it into first, simultaneously punch the throttle and release the clutch and, in a number of seconds only slightly greater than your reaction time, peak at 40 miles per hour. The sensation of catapulting acceleration is unforgettable. Second, again with tremendous G's, propels the car up to the high 60s in scant seconds more. Third is a wonderfully useful ratio with terrific dig from about 9 to 96 miles per hour. The torque of the little 3.0 liter engine is fantastic and it's hard to see where it all comes from until you remember that the injection system is pumping fuel into the cylinders at a constant rate that carburetors cannot match. Fourth gear, with the standard rear axle ratio, Give smooth, continuous acceleration from 15 to 140 miles per hour. It is thoroughly adequate for city traffic and even for pulling fairly stiff grades. For fierce acceleration and fast hill climbing, third meets nearly all requirements. During our shakedown tests among the steep peaks and canyons of the Santa Monica mountain range, we had to resort to second cog only on the very steepest grades, and then we flew up to them. As for first gear, you should always use it when starting from a standstill. Beyond that, you just keep it in reserve for pulling stumps and for competing in the Alpine Rally. There are tricks to driving the car. Its steering, with less than two turns from lock to lock, is definitely heavy and has a wonderful feel. The steering gear itself is of the no backlash recirculating ball type with hydraulic centering. The brakes are magnificent and indestructible, and they're vacuum assisted. But they don't lock the wheels at a touch, Detroit power brake style. They demand some muscle power, and so do the clutch and the shift lever. 
In the 300 SL, driving is not the near spectator sport it has largely become in this age of robotized motoring. Minimum muscular endowment is required for the comfortable operation of the 300 SL, caution and sound judgment, however, are essential to the continuing enjoyment of this or any other high-performance car and even a small error can have very discouraging consequences. For example, I had read in both a British and an American road test that the car should be pushed through turns under power, actually steered with the throttle. As we approached our first tight corner, I mentioned this to Ludge. No, no, he cried. Do that and the rear end come swinging around. With these pendulum axles, you have to be careful. The oversteer isn't much if you have competition springs, but with standard springs, you must watch it all the time. At this point, I asked Ludge to demonstrate proper fast cornering technique with the 300 SL, and he took the wheel. He popped his gear changes with a smart, hard style and reached his desired speed of entry into the turn. All the way around the curve, he maintained neutral acceleration, just patting the throttle lightly and occasionally to keep his velocity constant. As the curve began to straighten out, he stomped the throttle to the floorboards, rocketing into the straight. Further checking with men who have driven 300 SLs in competition verified this as the one and only technique for keeping out of trouble during high-speed cornering. With this car, you do not horse around with throttle steering. During the very hardest cornering, there is no perceptible body roll and you feel an unusual sense of security. This is added to considerably by the car's phenomenal brakes, which are fade-proof and provide uncanny stopping distances. The adjustable bucket seats give excellent support against sideways motion. There's a remarkable absence of wind noise in this car, even at 138 miles per hour, but otherwise it is by no means a silent servant. The auxiliary fuel pump, used constantly at high speeds, emits a nervous whine at the driver's back. The indirect transmission gears have a loud, vintage buzz. These sounds are more or less musical to the enthusiastic ear. Less so is the peculiar, harmless clunking noise that originates in the rear axle mechanism of these cars when some, but not all, left turns are made. The coil spring four-wheel independent suspension gives a ride that is surprisingly soft. The cornering feel in particular is quite different from that of a fast, solid axle machine and is hard to describe. In place of the sensation of unyielding chassis bite on the road, there's a softness to the 300 SL's cornering grip. You do not feel as though you're on rails. You know damned well you're on rubber tires. The bite is tenacious all right, but not harsh. Barreling full bore down a straightaway, the car never feels as though it's becoming lighter. At top speed, it still squats like a stalking cat and its traction under all conditions is pretty unbeatable. So far, we've been talking about the basic 300 SL economy model with a touring car camshaft. With this setup, the output is 220 horsepower, the engine idles at 750 RPM, and the torque characteristics are quite uniform throughout the engine RPM range. This combination makes for one of the most thrilling rides of your life. That is, until you experience a 300 SL running the hot competition cam. With this one modification, the car acquires an entirely new character. Now it peaks at 240 horsepower, a figure incidentally, which other road tests have mistakenly associated with the standard model, and it idles at 1,100 revs. In the lower engine speed range, it is slightly rougher, and it neither adds to nor subtracts from the vehicle's performance. It's in the higher RPMs that it makes another car of the 300 SL. Lance Reventlow of Hollywood is the devoted owner of a 300 SL with the racing cam and all the other performance options. His car has heavy-duty springs and shock absorbers, rudge wheels, an assortment of rear axle ratios, and special racing tires. It also has one of the all-aluminum bodies that the factory has available. The light body represents a weight saving of about 350 pounds and Reventlow's car represents an investment of well over $10,000. To be continued in the next clip.